Rick, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, Keith. Great to be back Good. with you as always. Man, you know how I feel about you. <laughs> I love you, man. I'm always happy to see you. I love you too, Good. man. And, and you know, we've both contributed to our lives in a way that has made not only sense for us, but in a way that's helped us help other people a little bit anyway. Yeah, I, I hope so, you know. We're having so much fun, man. Yeah, you know, totally, totally. It's so much fun. But you know, that's what life should be, right? People helping other people, people who are maybe have different political views. It doesn't matter. We're all people. We all want pretty much the same thing. A little bit of security, a little bit of challenge, a little bit of love. Exactly. And I think where uh, people kind of lose sight of that is when they place expectations on other people others, or on themselves. And that happens to be the title of today's show, Expectations. Whoa, that's a biggie. Um, well, let me give you a couple of uh, thoughts and then you can uh, contribute as well and, and maybe we can kind of riff on this together. I think one of the problems with expectations is that if you set an expectation and you don't hit it, the effect that you have on yourself that um, kind of spirals down into anxiety or depression or just a feeling of, um, of, of failure, is, is incorrect because expectations are basically there as a guide. They're not there as a measure of success. And the more we have expectations, the more we are likely to be disappointed. There's a Zen saying, for example, that is, um, it's easier to ride the horse in the direction he's going, meaning that there's no expectation of wherever the horse goes. Now I know we can't live that way, but if we would back off a little bit, and take a look at what our overarching goal is and not be concerned about whether the intermediate steps are all perfect. Yeah, I, I really like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought that what we talk about because we got some letters in and some people have asked us to do a show on expectations. So I thought we would first talk about personal expectations and uh, what our experience has been with that as well as the expectations <laughs> we may place on others. And what I've found when it came to expectation, when I really examined it on a personal level, that if I didn't meet them, it came with a lot of suffering. Mm -hmm. And you know, I know life is all suffering, right? That's, that's what they say in, in uh, is it Zen? Buddhism. In it's Buddhism. The first yeah. noble truth. The first noble truth, all life is suffering. Yes, sir. And so I kind of get, you know, I've, I've embraced that over the years. And most recently, I've really embraced it. And it's given me a quite a bit of freedom to know that, just be with the journey, there's gonna be, there may be some suffering along the way, but uh, find the beauty that's also present there too. And with me personally, I had expectations in every aspect of my life. Uh, how I was going to perform in school from a kid all the way through college, uh, in the workplace, in my career, in relationships, mm -hmm. the goals I have for my body, and the guilt and blame I placed on myself if I fell short, no matter what the reason was. Mm -hmm. It could be that I was sick and I wasn't able to answer the bell at school, or it could have been that I was injured and I would beat myself up and nothing good comes from that, I've learned. And so I've really learned to let go of expectations. You know, I can be hopeful, you know, I can set goals, but it's not, but I'm not attached to the outcome. I'm more committed to just being part of the journey, being present for all the lessons and beauty that come along the way. What about you? Yeah, same story. Process is the most important thing. Journey is the more, most important thing. Uh, arriving is something that might be the cherry on top, but honestly, that's really not where the game is played. The, the, you know, your life is basically made up of a series of steps, of small steps that we, we do every day. And those things have to have meaning in and of themselves. So when you think about things that are truly important to you, like your health, um, the fact that you're not having any issues with your, 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 your career, let's say, on that day. Those are things that need to be celebrated. Let me give you one other thing, I think, from Absolutely. Buddhism, since we cracked open that. You know what's interesting about that, though? <laughs> okay, what? It, is that, you know, to celebrate your health, you know, feeling uh, good that day, being able to get up out of bed that day, opening your eyes, and as well as no issues with your career, is that as human beings, we don't normally focus on that stuff. No, you know, no. we focus on what's wrong or what's missing. Uh, so, and that is tied to expectations. But go ahead and tell me about what you want to say. That's a huge topic right there. There's another show right there, the idea of what you're focusing on. Because what you think about, what your mind thinks about most of the time, 
is what happens to you. So if you're constantly churning negatives, you're constantly putting fires out in your head when the fires haven't even started, those things actually tend to create the very thing that you're worried about. But here's what I was going to say about Buddhism. Um, since we cracked, <laughs> cracked that open a little bit, Buddhism says that one of the things that's really, really, really hard for people to get is the notion that desire is the source of all your discontent. You know, if you don't have any expectations, think of it. You don't have any expectations, well, whatever shows up is cool. Okay, the house burned down, we have to sleep outside, cool. Okay, we don't have any food tonight, we'll have some tomorrow. Okay, whatever, that's fine. Here, you want a million dollars. Oh, okay. It's sort of that flat effect that's impossible, but I use those examples to show kind of the extreme of the, of the, um, uh, of the brackets of gradation. But the, uh, the reality, there's, a, there's really a lot of truth of that. The more you desire, the more you want, the more you need, it's like arguing with the universe and trying to create something like a control where you can say, hey, I get to turn the spigot on whenever the hell I want. You know what's interesting about that is, you know, maybe five or six years ago, I would have argued <laughs> against you with that to say that, what do you mean I can't have expectations of goals of myself? How else am I going to drive myself forward to uh, be my best or accomplish <clears throat> these things, make a lot of money, uh, climb the career ladder, yeah. uh, have the perfect life if I don't set expectations, have high expectations or set big goals? And, and I've done that, I've lived that life, and there's been a ton of pain and suffering when something didn't work out, my identity was tied to those goals, that expectation, and if they didn't come through, if the goals weren't realized, man, I mean, I, I went deep. I mean, in some cases, there was a lot of depression that set in. Well, and that's part of what we see in our culture all the time. People who are striving, striving, striving for success. There's really, I think, less of a psychology of arriving or, or being in a place that is great. You know, one of the ideas um, uh, that's, I think, throughout all the self-help literature is the notion that you have value just as you sit here today. It's not whether you make a lot of dough or it's right. not whether you have a great big house or any of the other material things. It's the value that's inherent in the life force. And so when people are talking about um, getting more in touch with nature, one of the things that, that's happening is you're finding out that you, in a way, share a lot with a tree or you share a lot with a squirrel in the sense that there's a life force within you. And if you watch how little kids approach life, they approach it like animals, like squirrels, like, you, right. like your pet dog. They're happy to have their belly scratched, they're happy to play a game. There isn't any of that until <laughs> until about five years old, or maybe two years old, the terrible twos, when ego starts showing right. up. Because the ego is the one that wants all that stuff. If you are able to get past that and just focus on your, your consciousness without any ego, those disappointments you could brush off a bit easier. But I don't think we're talking about or recommending that anybody stop creating goals. I mean, after all, to be reads about being successful and about setting goals for yourself and your family, including physical goals and spiritual goals and so forth. Right. Um, so I think maybe what we're saying is you have the goals, but you work and work and do the best that you can, and then you step back and detach, and that's it. Exactly. You, you, you give it that all. Right. And then it's exactly. it. Then yeah. it's up to the universe. It's yeah. not your call after that, right? Exactly. The goal becomes just being your personal best. Uh, let's both give an example of a time in the past in which we've had expectations, what, ex what that experience was like, as well as where you are today, and you know, just what you've learned from the teachers and from life experiences so far. Okay, sure, well I'll give you one. Um, in my business, I'm in a win, sort of a, a win-lose, it's, it's called a zero-sum game, I'm a lawyer, so there's no second place. Um, you basically win the case, you lose the case, and so there's a lot usually writing on whatever um, case I'm working on. So the trick is to try to figure out a way, if you can, where you put all of the effort in that you can. You work as hard as you can, as I said. You, you do all the things that you can and then you step back and try not to control outcome. But, giving a quick example of what happened to me once, I had, I thought, a really great case and I presented the whole thing. I didn't get hit too bad by the opposition and I was really, really ready for a nice big reward at the end of the case. Well, sure enough, what happened? The jury came back against me. And I went up and I talked to them and I said, well, you know, I, I, I had all this evidence. How come? What's the story? Why, why did you go d different than this? And they said, well, we didn't like your client. We didn't think that he was asking for something that was just. I was so close to the case. My expectation was that I would win based on the facts and not based on the heart. Right. And this was a heart verdict by the jury. So that put me in a tailspin. 
Now I'm to the point where it, when I have a jury trial, I don't take the verdict because as soon as I finish my closing argument, I walk out. I don't deal with the case any longer except to answer client questions. Right. Because I've done my work. Right. There's nothing more I can do. It's out of your hands. It's out of my hands. You don't get to vote on the outcome. You get to vote and make choices about how hard you prepare and what you want to do with with the motivation and with the effort. But after that, it is out of your hands. It's somewhere else, but it ain't with you. <laughs> that's, that's a great, great point. Uh, for me, a lot of it has become, uh, as I alluded to in a previous podcast, uh, my fear has always been, up until recently, has been unrealized potential, not living up to what I expect from myself. And that's been pretty tough. Uh, so years and years ago, I, if I struggled with an exercise, for example, and this is a good one, I would never show people me struggling. I wouldn't show them in that period of trying to get better. You would see me already there. Like I've mastered the exercise. Uh, I can do this. I can jump higher than most people. I can run faster than most people. I've already done it. And uh, one time I, you know, uh, got beat. and. And uh, I was trying to find every reason in this foot race why, why this kid beat me. He was, he was younger than me, and I just felt I was taller, I was stronger, that I should beat this kid. And uh, it was, it was I know, right? It was like eight, crazy. It was eight years ago. It's crazy. Uh, and so I was younger. I should have been faster. And I really took it hard because I had a huge expectation. Uh, everyone, he was gracious in this victory. You know, he didn't uh, taunt his chest. Like some people take a lot of pleasure in, in beating me. And this guy didn't do that. He was great. And uh, that was really, really tough for me. Uh, I've had the same experience in relationships in which I expected a certain outcome. They went a different way. And uh, it was out of my control. And so fast forward now when I come against uh, or come up against an exercise that I struggle to perform, you know, I feel very content knowing that I gave it my best effort. And I can celebrate the people around me and be inspired by them having been able to do it and master the exercise. Well, you know, and that's reason, that, that leads to something else, which is not only expectations of ourselves, but what are the expectations that we have for other people? In your case, I think by making yourself vulnerable, and let's say you go to the squat rack and you are the leader, right? You, you know what you're doing. Let's say you try something new that's a little bit different and you know you're not good at it. And if you say, hey guys, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with this too. How do we figure this thing out? There's a value that comes from showing the vulnerability. Right. And there's also a likewise return on your output of that vulnerability from those who are watching you struggle and you try to so sort of solve it together. I think that that idea of, of just being honest with people and not having any agenda, and if you don't know how to do it, don't worry about looking bad, just, just do it. Exactly. Somebody will help you. Exactly. What's an example of you having expectations of someone else mm -hmm. and the experience of that? Oh, sure. Well, um, I think this is probably typical for most of our viewers. Uh, we all have, pretty much all of us have kids. So one of the things that I wanted to make sure was that my son was on the right path, right path, right? Okay. So um, I tried to do all the things that parents do, uh, competitive parents do, the helicopter parents do, you know, the soccer, the schools, and all of that stuff. And that was wonderful. It was great for a bond for, for us and, and, and my son. Um, but the reality is, when he finished um, his schooling, he went to work for um, a car repair place. Now here's a guy who, who's had a very expensive pedigree, went to Cal Berkeley, graduated with honors, and uh, he, went, he, he wants to repair cars and, and do uh, video games, create video games, writing software. That took some time for me to adjust to. And the only way that I could come up with it that made sense was he's on his own journey. Man, you gotta back off. You know, it's, what do you want for your son, Rick? Really, what do you want for your son? Happiness. Happiness, so yeah. if he's happy doing that stuff, Mission accomplished, man. Move on. Let's have dinner. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, you don't want to get it messing with somebody else's goals or somebody else's right. life, even when they're your kid. Now, that's not to say that if the kid is 13, has a lot of potential, and just wants to play video games all day and won't do his homework, that's a different issue. But when the kid's 20 or 25 or whatever, and his, he's launched and he's into his thing, I think it's dumb to be thinking, geez, you know, you should have done this, you should have done that. Right. Why aren't you alone? That's goofy. Exactly. And in, in this case with, with you, uh, you know, he was choosing another profession uh, other than what you thought that he, he should choose. Uh, some parents, though, uh, is, is something that's a little bit different. 
and that maybe the kid is struggling with some kind of challenges, like a, a, an addiction. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, or hanging out with the you know crowd, the bad crowd, and so that's that's, that's probably tougher. But it's the same thing. Their launch is their life, is their journey, and you just continue to be a loving stand for them without preaching, nagging, telling them that they are making you know a, a bad choices in life. You just accept it. Well, I would say that you hold space for them, and holding space means giving them the freedom to make their own mistakes. That's really important. And I think holding space also applies to spouses. Sometimes in our marriages, and our relationships, we are going through changes all the time. Maybe the other person isn't. Right. But if we hold space for them, and we, we send love to them, and, and, and really want their well-being, things will sort of right themselves. And if they don't, well, then there's time, it may, may be time to look at whether it's a, a relationship that's worth pursuing. Right. And you can't control it. No, totally not. Yeah, so, but that's what we think we can do. Well, one, one thing before we leave the topic of the kids, I, I also am a big proponent of professional help when you get into a situation like addiction because the message from the parents ought to be that you're on the wrong path. And from the, the therapist, it ought to be something like that also with therapies that are designed to help the child and the parents I like it. Uh, sort of work through this thing together. Absolutely. And I think they need to have a clear message, this is not gonna work out for you because you're harming yourself. Right. But you also still have to stand back and say, it's your journey. You invited addiction in, it's your journey. You gotta handle it. Right, and I, I agree with you that having some professional support is, is, is key there. You know, everybody's yeah. focused on healing and uh, helping the young person and the family be healthy. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, we didn't thank our, our viewers before. You guys have been great. We've gotten all kinds of interesting feedback, everything to um, why do you have so much extra skin in my throat? Why does Keith wear red sometimes with shirts? It doesn't look good. we got to change it. So I'm going to wear paper clips on my neck so you guys don't focus on that. Well, I'm going to keep rocking the red. <laughs> uh, you know, it's my power it's, color. It's your power color. Uh, you know, know I just want to give one example before we get out of here. An example of me being in this line of work that I've chosen to be in, which I love. Yeah. And you're good uh, at it. I mean, <laughs> and you thank help, you. helped a lot of people. Bro. Thank you. I helped appreciate it. Thanks, Rick. Um, for me, uh, it's having expectations of other people. You know, once a month uh, or so, we have these assessments. And they're check-ins to where people set goals themselves. And I don't care what the goal is, whether it's to lose weight or be stronger. But it's a nice check-in with yourself so, you know, you don't hide out. And one of the expectations, not expectations, but one of the things we do is people come in, they jump on the scale, they do measurements and things like that. You know, our, our friend Tim, who we will have on a future show, he's like, green screen assessment, anytime, let me know I'm ready to go. <laughs> yeah. And so we have this little uh, quote that, uh, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. That's a great, that's a great way. <laughs> and so he has that, but not everybody thinks of it that way. And so uh, once, it, uh, there was a time years ago where if people refuse to take an assessment, I would come, oh man, I would, I'm not proud to say, I, I would shame them into taking one about playing small and things like that. And it was a way of, of being controlling. And since then I've given that up. I, you know, uh, compassionately uh, invite people to take one. And if they choose not to weigh themselves and get measured, then that's okay, that's their choice. And, uh, and I am just trying to be an unconditional loving stand and hold that space that you talked away. And you know, Keith, the, the upshot of that, I think, for somebody like, who would be on the receiving end of that, if, if I was embarrassed and I knew I missed my goals and I didn't go through it, that would be a teaching opportunity. And I've seen you do this, where Thank you, you take them aside and say, no, look, no pressure. But this was your goal, and it wasn't my goal. Right. It didn't hurt my feelings you didn't make it, but this was your goal. All you had to do was take baby steps to it. You didn't do that. Are you committed? Are you right. really committed? Well, is this something you. you really want? Thank you. And, and holding them accountable, I think, is important. Holding people accountable who are friends and family and people you're responsible for and, and those you love. We hold each other accountable all the Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Yeah, and as long as the, the accountability is where both parties have agreed to it, then I think it's healthy. It's when uh, there hasn't been an agreement from both parties about the accountability, and then you see the expectations come in. Oh, that's another good point. Yeah. yeah, agreement is key. Agreement is key. I think that sets the tone for the entire relationship. You know, boundaries, very important. Absolutely. Agreement, consent, very Exactly, important. and we've had agreements throughout to be re and with every assessment and every, everything else we do, and uh, even when those agreements are not met or kept, uh, it's important to accept the other person's choice and uh, just respond with love. Any final thoughts? 
None for me, man. Um, what's your, what, what would you like people to take away from the show, the, the big thing? Oh, man, a couple of things. One, expectations are okay if they're consistent with your goals. But when you don't make short-term expectation targets, don't give up on yourself and don't feel bad if you can avoid doing that. Maybe you want to reassess your goal. That's number one. Number two, keep in mind that at the very root of the notion of expectation is the concept of suffering. The more expectations, the more suffering. All suffering comes from desire. Now, that doesn't mean you eliminate every desire you can't in this world, but you try to minimize them as much as possible. Thirdly, when you're dealing with other people, remember the key phrase, it's their journey. That's right, that's right. Great show, my friend. Thanks again. Party on, girls. Party on. <laughs>